Specifically, what we're going to look at is proper employment of aircraft. Okay, you are very hot. You want to be able to stay out there and stay in the fight. The success of that mission is going to be dependent on the weapons that you choose. The M4 carbine is a very realistic platform to use. Next weapon system is volt action. All right, now we're going to move into shotgun. Next thing we're going to move on to is, is more of a squad automatic weapon system. So I want to be able to work the gun, lean out as much as possible. Because that's when your perspective of the battlefield changes. Guys, thank you very much for coming out. This will be Magpul Dynamics Aerial Platform Operations class. Today we're going to cover a lot of, uh, a lot of fundamentals that, that need to be talked about when uh, talking about aircrafts and your involvement with aircrafts. My name is Chris Costa. This is Travis Haley. Specifically what we're going to look at is mission planning. And of course those are going to be specific to your standard operating procedures. We're going to look at your safety around the asset and not only when you're around it but when you're also inside it. Some of the other things that you need to be concerned about that you could find yourself in, especially in emergency situations if something happens to the bird. When we're looking at uh, LEO style operations, it could be surveillance operations that you guys may find yourselves in, um, doing more of a monitoring and detecting, passing information back to more of a, a command center, uh, relaying that information possibly before an assault. We also have military style operations that air assets can be utilized for, not only uh, military style operations but going a little bit further as well with uh, maritime interdiction operations. So whenever you're doing shipboard operations, it's also great to have a helo up to support. Uh, again, could be surveillance, it also could be employing a weapon system out of that helo. Uh, some of the other things that we're going to look at is proper gear selection. There is a lot of gear out there, some of which should be in the helo and some of which really is going to hinder you as, as an operator. And, and those are some of the things that we're going to hit on um, and Travis is going to lead us into theories and, and concepts that, uh, that you guys need to pay attention to. Um, yeah, guys, you know, th when, when people hear the term aerial platform operations, they think shooting of an air aircraft. And uh, we want to try to step back and let's look at this asset here. Let's look at what it brings to the table. Um, it doesn't just bring that capability to shoot a precision shot from an aircraft. Um, I like to take a look at it first in the fact that it's a perfect aerial platform reconnaissance surveillance platform. Um, it brings real-time intel, so if you guys are doing a mission or military or, or the um, maritime interdiction type operations, that platform is, is the key for communication to that mission commander. So if you've got guys on the ground that have limited field of view, limited um, uh, target analysis, the guy in the air, the aircraft, can give real-time video intel, um, audio intel back to the mission commander so he can give his ground forces better direction. So I like to think of it more as a, a life-saving tool because of the, the surveillance and the reconnaissance and the real-time intel capability brings not just the taking a shot. The shot for me is kind of last resort. It's, hey, you also can take a precision shot from the aircraft. Um, also, a lot of misconceptions about taking a precision shot from an aircraft are a lot of people think that you have to have a sniper in that role. Um, a guy that is a precision shot with a sniper rifle, uh, and he's the guy that is only capable, the only capable one to be able to do that. Well, let me tell you that there's really no such thing as sniping from an aircraft. Okay, you can take a well-trained carbine operator and put him in there with the right gear, the right setup, and set him up for success. Um, and if he's good at bringing that intel gathering capability, that reconnaissance surveillance capability to the table as well, which is why a lot of times we like to use snipers, but. That carbine guy, if he's also trained in that area, he can employ that carbine from the aircraft because we're going to talk about some things later when we get into weapons manipulation off of this bird that if you are setting yourself up for success, meaning what's your target area, what's your range, what's your speed, we're going to get into all those fine details because a guy taking a shot from a helicopter at 500 yards with a bolt action rifle with a 10 power magnification to me is a liability. Okay, because you are sucked into that scope, you're shooting at a range that is, is pretty unpractical and non-realistic with that type of weapon system. Now, if you're static and on the ground, you're not moving, of course, that's, that's what that weapon system is built for, but it's not built for this bird. So we're going to go over weapons and optics and talk about how to set yourself up for success. But that reality factor, 
the reality factor is how much liability are you bringing to the table? Are you really thinking about what you need to think about setting yourselves up, your weapons up for success? All right, guys, let's talk about some, uh, some misconceptions with aerial platform shooting. A lot of people think that this thing costs a lot of money to put off the ground and do an operation with. Uh, but let me give you a quick analogy. For you guys, specifically here, mostly being law enforcement, probably put on some of you, you guys are even small department types, probably put $30,000, $40,000 a week or every two weeks in fuel in your patrol vehicles, okay, a week. Now, to put this bird up for an hour, okay, a simple bird like just this A-Star, for example, could be $1,000, $1,500 an hour, depending on where you're at, what fuel costs are. So you do that analogy in your head, you th or think out that problem, do the math, and what would you rather have? Okay, send your ground guys in with no, no eyes on, no real-time intel, no prior surveillance or photography of the site that you're going to hit, so you guys are going in blind, or put this thing up and spend a couple extra hundred bucks or a thousand dollars, two thousand dollars maybe. It still doesn't compare to how much money we spend on a daily basis in our just our patrol cars alone, let alone all the other things that we spend money on. So I like to throw that out there just so people realize that it's really not that hard to jump in this thing and use it to increase survivability rate of those ground guys that are going into a high threat area. Okay, to get that that picture that you can bring back that takes 30, 40 minutes of airtime sit in the mission planning room and go, this is the most recent configuration of that house that we're going to hit today, okay? Or here's where the target is, whatever the target may be. So that cost to me is well worth that. And I would almost spend that out of my own, on my own pocket to ensure that my guys' lives are saved or their, their survivability is increased because of, of that intel that that bird gives you. All right, so let's, let's talk about how we uh, get this mission going. Mission planning being the first thing we want to talk about here today. Um, I don't want to get into SOPs. Uh, you guys have your own SOPs. Military has their own SOPs. Department of State, you know, Justice, Transportation, Coast Guard, stuff like that. Everybody has their own SOPs. So this course is not about bringing tactics in. It's about just the fundamentals, the building blocks of aerial platform operations, the communication, the weapons and aircraft rigging, uh, mission planning, just basic building blocks. So you guys can go back and take these building blocks and sit down and incorporate your SOPs into them. Um, so this is just the fundamentals of aerial platform operations. So you guys can take this portion, this small block of training back and, and maximize it to uh, your units uh, or agencies uh, expectations or requirements. So without getting into all the details of the mission planning, because you guys have your own mission planning SOPs, but that shooter or that aerial surveillance guy and that pilot should be incorporated into that mission brief so they know what to expect from the ground guys, from the mission commander, and the ground guys and the mission commander know what to expect from the aerial platform. Um, they need to be able to deliver what they are going to provide during that aerial platform operation, okay? whether it's the surveillance capability um, or maybe it's a surveillance mission that turns into an offensive role. Maybe you have to do an interdiction. Um, you know, maybe that wasn't planned, but that's what happened. So you need to have all those plan A, plan B, plan C type of things, all your different course of actions down. As the shooter and the pilot, you need to be able to deliver that block of information to the mission commander, to your ground team, and tell them, this is what we are here to do for you, okay? And this is what we, you can expect from us. The pilots have to understand a, a lot of time what the assaulters are going to be doing because, for instance, uh, I'll talk about maritime interdiction because that's primarily my background. On maritime interdiction, guys in the helo need to know how we are taking that ship down because externally they're trying to protect our movement. So one of the first general phases is making sure that when we do our mission planning that everybody's involved from the boat guys to the helo guys to the shooter that's in that helo should he or she be utilized in a shooter capacity as a force multiplier because of the, the job of the helo for us was overwatch. Uh, if there was no gun in the helo, which was very rare, then it would just be like, hey, we got a suspect or a threat moving on the exterior on a portion that we can't see. Because understand from ship to ship, we can maneuver around that ship all we want, but on a four or 600 foot ship, we can't see on the other side that we have guys hidden in spots. So when we start our assault or if we're doing a uh, compliant boarding or a non-compliant boarding or that non-compliant goes opposed, that helo can provide a lot of vital information to us and also solve threat problems that, that may occur. But in regards to that, what's very, very important is deconfliction between our operators and where those threats may be. Because as you guys are gonna find when you're in that helo and time is life and you gotta get behind that gun, 
Is that a friend or is that a foe? Because generally the first thing you see is a gun. And then now you have to quickly identify whether you can take that shot or not and whether that is one of yours or not. But what is also important is when you go back to that mission brief of where are your assaulters going? Uh, where are they going to be making movement to? Having comms with those guys so that you know that you're, you have a group of assaulters that are breaking to the exterior of, of a ship and they're going to be out on deck moving so you can expect to see assaulters there. You might have to change your position in the heel. You might have to ask the pilot to maneuver in a different position to give you a better position of advantage, to have better overwatch, to protect that team, to be a force multiplier, not leave your helo in a position where you know you got assaulters coming out here and your helo is here so technically you couldn't fire anyways does that make sense uh, allowing yourself to to utilize that asset for for what it's what it was kind of designed for and remember daytime operations are completely different than nighttime operations so when you're inside that helo having a night vision capability is extremely important because if all of a sudden you see a guy come out is that your guy or is that a threat trying to move on your team? And you have to quickly identify that. So things at night are much more dangerous than in the daytime. So deconflicting is extremely important. The bottom line is, is that everybody has to be involved from the pilots to the shooter on that helo, uh, if they're to ever be employed in, in that kind of capacity, to the assaulters understanding that, hey, if I break exterior, there's a guy in the air with a gun that I need to quickly say, hey, I just went exterior, uh, I'm out on whatever deck, and he's like, okay, I got you, I see you, I see you. Or, hey, there's a there's a threat three levels down, he's, he's moving, he's moving forward, and then I've got guys you know, in another overwatch position that might be able to direct fire there if, if it is a shoot situation. So all these things really come together, and as you can see, it's, it's sort of a little bit of a Pandora's box. Um, the, the halo can be there to aid you, but it can also be there and in, in, in hurt you in a capacity to where if you don't properly utilize it, comms between the teams, comms between the pilot, it, it's, it's of no use to you. So those are some other considerations that you need to think about when, when doing these style operations. And all those those aspects are key in mission planning, like the little tiny things that you normally forget about, like night operations, like Chris just mentioned, chem lights, uh, you know, infrared uh, glit patches, stuff like that. I mean, are your guys outfitted for that operation because you're putting an aircraft in the air? So your ground operation SOPs may change slightly because now you have an aerial platform. Um, and you know, you should probably incorporate those some of those things in anyways if you're running snipers. You know, snipers are running night vision. Hey, glit patches or uh, IR strobes, uh, stuff like that, that's going to help that aerial team or that ground sniper team uh, do their jobs a lot better. And you guys are going to feel more warm and fuzzy um, moving in that house or moving exterior out of that house. Because if I see somebody come out, that's the first thing I'm checking for. Is he glit? Is he strobing? If not, I'm going to do a double check, double check, maybe call in and say, hey, now this is where the communication comes into play. Maybe you have a course of action. If somebody does break exterior and their strobe's broke, you got to have a, a plan B, right? Hey, batteries go dead. So you go out and say, hey, has anybody broke exterior? Negative. Roger that. We've got somebody exterior, we're taking a shot. You may have to take that chance. Um, so all those things have to be talked about and incorporated. All the little tiny fine details that, uh, that you guys have in your SOPs need to be brought out again on the table so the aerial platform guys can sit down and go, okay, are we covered for that type of situation when, when things go wrong? And that's what we need to really concentrate, especially when you're sitting in an aircraft, you're, everything around you is just loud, vibrating, you can't hear anything except maybe people talking on the comms and you just see little objects down there. Things, your perspective of the battlefield changes. So when all that's going on and you see somebody pop out and you need to take a shot and you're sucked in, you better damn sure be uh, doing what you need to be doing and make sure your SOPs are employed because that's when things get bad after a good guy goes down because your SOPs weren't followed or that aerial platform team sat over in a corner did their own thing and the boarding team did their own thing and the snipers did their own thing. Mission planning, that's the most important thing about this. All right guys, we just got done talking about mission planning. Now let's talk about mission prep. Part of that mission prep is actually proper weapon selection, which is extremely important because the success of that mission is going to be somewhat dependent on the weapons that you choose. And we'll start with heavy weapons first. All right, say you have a mission that calls for a heavy weapon system like this, this M82, this Sasser here. This is obviously a mission specific weapon system. Obviously I'm not gonna be carrying this every time I go up in the air. It may be a destruction rate as far as maybe uh, placing rounds inside of a building. Maybe somebody stole an armored car and they're a serious lethal threat to society and you've gotta penetrate that armored vehicle. Obviously this is gonna come in handy in an aerial platform it can be used very easily from. 
Um, but what you want to look at on this weapon system is typically you'll find obviously magnified optics on a weapon system as big as this. Um, sometimes uh, an optic that will have some pretty serious magnification. But to set yourself up for success is optic choice. If this is a designated weapon system for aerial platform or short range use only, I'm going to put a short range zero magnification, uh, zero, man zero parallax optic on top of it like this aim point here. This is going to allow me to engage on the target, focusing on the target. Not focusing through the 10 powers or more of magnification. Because what happens when you are sucked through a scope um, that has magnification to it, your circle of awareness goes like this, doesn't it? So you're looking at just this big blurry vibrating target and now if you decide, okay, I've got a really clean shot, I can take that shot and you shoot and you miss or you shoot a weapon system like this and you hit your target, but what is your target's foreground and background? Do you know? Did that optic allow you that opportunity to see your foreground and background, that awareness of the target. So that's why I choose zero magnification optics for aerial platform shooting. I'm not going to be taking a shot like a static sniper at four, five, six to a thousand yards or more. Uh, or for this weapon system like 2,500 yards. So I don't need that because any farther than that certain range, that, that danger area, that threshold, like 200 to 300 yards, you're starting to talk liability now, especially with something like this. If you miss, where's that that heavy grain bullet going to. Now, if it's a long-range designated weapon, it's a weapon that sits in your armory and is only to be used at 2,500 meters, but seldom it can come out on a aerial platform situation maybe. Well, if you're running a magnified optic on there, then I'd suggest running a piggyback, okay? Some type of other optic that can handle the recoil of this gun, and that would be zeroed at those ranges that I would encounter in an aerial platform shoot, okay? So think about that. If you can't change the optics, because you're, you know, I know, I know from, from uh, having, building these custom sniper rifles, I'm not going to just sit there and take optics off and swap them. I'm going to piggyback it, so that way I'm not screwing with my dope on either site, and I've got the best of both worlds if that's the weapon that I have to choose. One thing that you guys need to consider is understanding that just don't put any red dot on there. You need to put an optic on there that's durable and that'll also handle the recoil of that 50 or any other potentially large caliber because just a recoil alone can mess with some of the cheaper optics, red dots that are out there can internally mess with the dope, which means one minute you're zeroed, next minute you're not zeroed and you're sitting there wondering why. Well, I'll tell you why. It's because that optic cannot handle the abuse in the recoil of the 50. So just consider that when you're about to throw a red dot on one of these guns and actually try to utilize it. All right, next weapon system is gonna be bolt action. A lot of times you'll definitely find these in the armory, especially for SWAT or anybody in, in more of a, a designated marksmanship role. So we're gonna cover it. Um, one of the things you can see is Travis already has a red dot piggybacked on top of this optic. This is a 10 power optic. So he's got the ability to utilize it as both. As we come down, we obviously have an ability to mount night vision as well. So we're increasing this weapon's capability. But one of the drawbacks to this weapon system is that you have to manually cycle that bolt. So in the event that you do miss a shot, later on today, when we talk about taking shots, a lot of times you'll realize that sometimes those shots aren't right where you need them, which means that when you see that splash and that impact is not on the threat, you're trying to shift to get that impact on the threat, which means that instead of just shifting and resetting the trigger and pressing again, you're now having to incorporate work in a bolt. And if you miss that next shot, again, as you can see, it's a slower system. So it's very mission specific. And just like uh, Chris talked about how I have this piggyback on here, this would be my primary optic for this weapon out of an aircraft. Okay, unless I had to utilize this night vision system because it's the only night vision system I had. Um, but again, this is my priority. Red dot, zero magnification, zero parallax. I can see the target area. I can see if somebody's an innocent person's running into the target area. I can see if a cruiser's running into the target area, a Humvee or something like that. So think about that when you're choosing weapons. Yep, which leads us to the next weapon system, which is more of a, a special purpose rifle build. As you can see, it's semi-auto, so it'll accept 20 round to 30 round magazines. When you look at it, it's, it's obviously set up for more of, a, more of a designated marksmanship role, but we've got another piggyback on top of that optic, and then it's semi-auto. So this is kind of like that happy medium. You're starting to see a lot of guys run these style of configurations because the follow-up shots are faster, uh, and if they do need to take more of a precision shot, they can. They have the scope on it. It's a 10, 10 power scope 
but they're piggybacking a red dot on it as well. So I'm getting a little bit more purpose out of this style weapon system other than say the bolt gun, which is a little bit more limited. Next thing we're gonna move on to is, is more of a squad automatic weapon system. We've really kept it simplified. All we're doing is we've got a high rate of fire. It's a, it's a heavier weapon system. Specifically, we're just running a red dot on it. So as far as being able to get rounds on target extremely quickly and then transition as being able to see like Travis was talking about, other officers running up on scene, or if you're in a military situation, you've got other friendlies moving around, you're gonna be able to see that a lot better than if you're running say uh, a powered optic, even a four by. A lot of guys think, well, I can run a four by on one of these things, but then we've got cheek weld issues, we've got eye relief issues. So on uh, an aim point, you don't really have those issues. Once you get behind it, you get on the gun and you start working it from there. Um, talking about this weapon, since it's obviously a little heavier, um, it's got a lot more things going on with it, especially when you add a, a 200 round box magazine, linked ammo in there. Um, building simple rigging systems. We're going to talk about rigging systems here in a little bit, but since this one's kind of probably more the elaborate rigging system, um, we'll go into it real quick. Basically, this is a sling system that uh, we developed over at Iraq flying on some little birds, and it actually worked really well to to stabilize the weapon system, to really take the vibration out of it, and it's basically some simple stuff that you can buy at your local hardware store. Um, basically, I have two small bungee cords um, going to a, a carabiner bungee cord. This is just a doubled over, uh, new style carabiner built-in bungee cord that's injection molded. And then I have my carabiner that I'll go into the rigging on the helicopter, which we'll show you guys. And then back here, I've got a solid line. This is 550 cord, and uh, it goes from the carabiner back to the rear side of the saw, okay? Um, we've tested this pretty good. The, uh, the locking buttons on the saw, pretty solid, even with these attached, and because uh, it does distribute the load pretty evenly. So when this weapon system is hanging, it's kind of just a nice gyro that takes off the system, and I can move it up and down. I can move it very freely, and uh, it really helps when you're carrying a big squad automatic heavy weapon system like this. So we'll get more into that rigging here in a little bit, but a saw, um, great military weapon platform. It's, it's really shocking how accurate and effective this weapon system can be from an aerial platform. Again, shooting inside that, that range that we say is a non-liability range uh, with, with weapons shooting on an aircraft. With the combination of uh, optics, the right sling system, setting yourself up for success, a good shooting platform, which again we'll discuss out there on the birds, um, this can be a very practical weapon. All right, now we're gonna move into shotguns. You'd be surprised how many departments still, uh, and there's a couple different uses for 12 gauge shotguns. Some, some departments don't have a capability right now. Uh, they don't allow carbines for whatever reason. Um, so you might find a shotgun in your arsenal. The shotgun still can be used. Understand that uh, if you're running a pump or even a semi-auto, first thing is limiting factor on ammo, meaning that you're, gonna, you're probably gonna run slugs out of it so it's a lot more accurate. If you run double op buck, that spread's gonna start you know, being affected, uh, being affected in regards to trying to get a good shot on target. Um, when you start looking at the 12 gauge, again, ammo, the ability to load it under stress, manipulate it. But for say a car, even though I may not have a 50 at my department, if I'm running a 12 gauge shotgun with slugs, that could be utilized on stopping a vehicle. So there, there, there are some, there are some pros to that. Also, if you're in area in certain areas of the country doing animal eradication, then running a 12 gauge with some double up buck might be a good way to go to put down animals if you can't get in there to eradicate them on foot. Because a lot of times, obviously, animals move extremely quickly, but you're probably not gonna be able to outrun, or an animal's not gonna be able to outrun a helicopter. So running a 12 gauge might be a better role for that. Yeah, and this is a capable weapon out to 200 yards easily uh, with a good slug. Even an op buck, you can get a pretty tight pattern with some of these chokes and specific ammo um, and get very effective out to good range. The next shotgun that we have set up it is a semi-auto shotgun. It is very small. It's primarily configured for breaching. But if you had a little bit longer barrel on it, then this might be that happy medium between having uh, good firepower, being able to switch from slugs to double op buck. And then not only, not only that, but you obviously have a semi-auto uh, ability where you didn't really have 
before uh, if you're working, say, a pump shotgun. Um, it's magazine fed, which means that changing out the mags are, is very quickly. Vice trying to hand load, whether it's a semi-auto or whether it's a pump, you have individual rounds that you're trying to load in the shotgun. And later, when, uh, when we go outside, we're going to talk about what can potentially happen if a round flies out of your hand and then ends up going to the back end of the helicopter. Could be a little catastrophic for you. So keeping them contained in a box might be a better and safer option for you. Now, if putting a big slug on target is, is what your goal is, then something like this uh, 50, which is in more of an M4 style configuration that most departments are used to because you're shooting your guns in, in 5.56 already, then all you're really doing is changing the upper and then taking the rounds and putting them into an existing M4 magazine. Now, it is a really large bullet, and that bullet is going to be compromised at certain yardages, meaning probably 200 yards and in is is, is as far as I'm gonna take this particular weapon system and add it a helo, I might run it a little bit closer. But as far as punching engines, whether it's the outboards on a, uh, on a boat or whether it's a vehicle or even a person at, at, at a certain range, you still, could, you still could do some damage. The recoil is pretty substantial. And when you put a standard 30 round magazine, 5.56 five, magazine in this weapon system, you limit your capacity to 10 rounds. So for me, if I had a choice between this um, with a 10 round system and a heavy recoil uh, or vice, say maybe a battle rifle like Chris is running with a 20 to 25 round mag, um, I'd probably choose a 7.62 because I've got more rounds, I've got just as much punch, I'm going to punch through an engine block uh, or a boat motor uh, inboard or outboard and uh, it's a very effective clean running package and the recoil is probably it's going to be less than that 50 Beowulf. One of the other aspects of running something like this, like Travis said, I've got 20 rounds detachable magazine so as soon as I do a reload I've got another 20 in the gun I'm, I'm not limited on ammo capacity generally I'll set my battle rifle up just like I will my normal 556 gun my normal M4 I'll throw something small on it so uh, uh, I'll run an aim point on it and then as we progress and as we talk about later on when we start looking at specifically getting in and out of helos, should I need to be a force multiplier on the ground really quickly, then I'm carrying something that I could actually utilize on the ground, shoot and employ on the ground, move in with a team, do whatever I need to do from, from point A to point B and, kind of a multi, and keep it the multi same. Role. So you'd, obviously we're running one five five six, but if you wanna if you got a mission to take out a vehicle in conjunction to that mission and maybe you have to insert like Chris is saying, then you've got the best of both worlds there. Talking about more of a, a practical weapon is what we, we like to call it because it's our everyday use weapon. Uh, the M4 carbine uh, platform is, is a, uh, a very, very realistic platform to use. Uh, we've got a lot of different mission specific weapons out here, but if I'm going to grab any weapon system on an aerial platform operation, it's probably going to be my standard M4 because it is a multi-use weapon system and it's very effective even on vehicles. All right, on my particular weapon, I've got it set up specifically for an aerial platform shooting operation. In case I had to shoot during day operations or night operations, um, this thing is completely configured and I'll go through some of the features that I've put on it. Um, obviously, the biggest thing that stands out is this, this big um, turbo head Surefire 400 plus lumen light. Uh, gives me great low light or no light operations. I can pretty much torch an, uh, an area out to 200 to 300 yards and give ground units light or the pilot light in case you're using an outsource helicopter and uh, he doesn't have a lighting system on the helicopter. You can use it. He can go off of your light. Um, I obviously have the, the T1 Micro Zero Mag, Zero Parallax optic on it. I'm running a visible green laser because green lasers are really visible at far distances um, in low light and, and specifically no light operations. If I need to use it as a targeting device, I can. Um, also, what I keep it on here for is a marking device. So if I need to mark a door for operators that aren't running night vision, I can mark a specific door on a property. Maybe there's a bunch of buildings. I can mark that door in the ground units know right where to go because okay, I have an advantage position. Same with the, um, the IR laser system here. I can do the same marking or targeting uh, as the visible laser, and we'll talk more about IR lasers in, in night vision later. I've got a ready mag system on this, this weapon system. I like to carry a lot of ammo at the ready so I can quickly reload if I need to, especially if I only have a certain time zone. Of, if I see a uh, target coming up and I've got 
10 seconds to get a bunch of rounds off and I've really got to suppress it. Uh, or maybe I've already suppressed another target and another one comes up and I've got to do a speed reload and the target's not down yet. I can quickly get this weapon system into the fight. Um, what I have on here is a lanyard system and I'll show you guys out at the bird uh, a little later how it's employed. But this is to retain the magazine from flying out of the aircraft and possibly into a tail rotor. Uh, probably one of the worst things you can have happen is one of these fly back there. It will take down an aircraft and you'll get the short ride to the ground. So again, a lanyard system on your primary magazine. I've got it hooked to this, this uh, one of our Ranger plates here and it uh, works real well. And it's a simple fast X so I can disconnect it and reconnect the new one if I need to. I've got that just going back to my QD. Uh, into the stock, but I don't need to necessarily have it in there. I just like to have it in case I take the weapon off, I can lay it down, but you can also hook it into your body or something. 550 cord, anything really works. But uh, this is pretty much set up the most practical for me. And uh, I've got a little bit longer barrel on it. I like to have a little bit longer barrel so I can have a reference looking down the barrel at the target. It helps pick up a little bit quicker and it helps in reference to my target's foreground and background. That helicopter does a strong bank and I look up, I can see in reference with this longer weapon system, hey, I'm about to shoot through the rotors, which again, you can get the short ride to the ground, so you gotta be careful there. Um, but I've got all my pressure pads wired together for, so I can sit here and maintain the same proper grip and fundamentals and work my visible, my IR, and my lighting system from one side in one pressure switch only. And uh, just by utilizing the master switches on the optics and lasers themselves, um, I can switch back and forth. So that's my personal choice. Chris is running a similar weapon system, kind of a shorter weapon system, but he's got it suppressed. Suppressors are a really good thing to use, uh, depending on what you want to do. If you want to kind of help the pilot, maybe you're running all the doors off or something. This will direct, obviously, all the blasts, minimize the overpressure, help him fly the aircraft a little bit better. So if you guys have those in your arsenal, great thing to put on the weapon system. I think in the end, what's, in, what's important to understand is that there are many different ways to set your guns up. And I think if you understand or get anything, there's sometimes choices that you don't get to make, meaning the gun you have is the gun you have the day you jump into that helo if, if it's a time is life situation. Just understand, uh, we'll cover how to set it up and how to bet best set your gun up for success is, is what's really important. As you can see though, if we do have an opportunity to choose, uh, I, I think a lot of what you're seeing is that everything's being driven to more of a red dot style optic. Uh, the second thing is we're trying to run a semi-auto for simplicity. We're trying to run something where if we run out of that mag, we can swap mags really quickly. And, and again, set that gun up so that the mission that you guys are running, it'll solve 98% of the problems that you're going to have happen out there. Where we're basically going to go next, guys, is we're going to start looking at how to rig different style helicopters. We're going to start with the A-Star, and then we're going to move on uh, to another helicopter outside and, and start showing you how to take these different platforms that we've just got done covering and how you can best utilize that particular platform that you either chose or that you're stuck with uh, to support guys on the ground. Okay, guys, we just finished up with weapons. Uh, now we're going to come over here and uh, start rigging this A-Star. This is a pretty popular aircraft amongst uh, law enforcement, uh, and uh, it's a pretty simple aircraft to, to rig. Now there's lots of different configurations uh, as far as harnesses and webbing and, and, and rigging, and we'll talk about a couple of different things, but um, think about when you're rigging an aircraft, uh, it's good to have somebody that's either qualified, like a hearse master, like a, a helicopter rope suspension training guide that does uh, rescue, um, search and rescue type operations, which obviously this is another aer that's another aerial platform operation. Um, so when you're rigging this aircraft, it's good to have one of those guys that's trained or somebody that's good with rope management and, and good with rigging systems to, to be the guy that's, that's um, gonna be rigging this. Or if you have a designated aerial platform guy, he should probably be trained up in, in proper rigging because obviously it's a huge safety issue when you're hanging out on the side of a helicopter. One of the biggest things is if you don't have those assets available, talk to the pilots. They're going to let you know really quickly what you're allowed to hook into and what you're not allowed to hook into and areas that you need to stay away from. Like for instance, right over here where the controls are, you're not going to hook into anything like this plate because uh, this area of the aircraft is vital for survival, your survival, his survival or hers. So depending upon where you hook in could be catastrophic. So again, if, if you don't know as a shooter, just talk to the pilots. They're going to be able to direct you right away. A lot of times people get really extravagant with, with rigging systems and you really don't need to get out of control with it. Um, I like to use a kind of a keep it simple, uh, stupid method here. Um, 
Sometimes people get a little too uh, overcomplicated with, with rigging, and especially harnesses. I see a lot of guys wearing full body harnesses. Um, maybe it's a comfort thing, a, a, a security feeling, um, but you really don't need all this, this uh, equipment. That's pretty much all it is. Especially when, like Chris just said, with, with controls of the aircraft, the collective, especially if you're, if you're shooting on the collective side, um, the last thing you want is a lot of straps flapping and stuff like this, because if this wraps around the collective, that's the last thing you want, because it's probably gonna be the last thing you're ever gonna see. It's gonna be a short ride. Yeah. So again, complicated systems, especially if you're that, that operator, maybe you're a SWAT guy, surveillance guy, and you've got to go assist ground forces and you've got to get off the bird. How is this rigged around your, your body armor? Is it too complicated? Probably for me, yeah. The last thing I want to be doing is jumping onto a rooftop or supporting ground guys wearing this plus all the other kit that I got to wear. Um, <clears throat> standard climbing seats really good option doesn't get in the way especially these smaller thinner ones they have nowadays uh, you can wear this with your kit in case you do have to support ground forces um, so that's a good option as well uh, we'll talk about that but uh, some simple things everybody here or in military specifically uh, get issued or wear riggers belts uh, riggers belts are a really good option for this and we'll show you how to safely rig in with this and not lose that sense of security um, but Thinking about these types of systems here, like this is a built-in webbing. I like this because when I'm wearing it, it's comfortable until I need to clip into it. Or you've got some of these other ones that have the, uh, the triangular mounting ring systems uh, built into the webbing. But the key thing you always want to remember is making sure that you double this over. Okay, when you feed this through, you've got to make sure that you route it through the friction adapter. Okay, because if you don't do that, because I, I know I get lazy sometimes, especially with these Velcro ones, I'll just put it through the big one because I'm out on, on patrol or I'm just walking around and I just want comfort. I don't feel like routing it through and tightening it down, but the last thing you want to do is forget to do that, jump in a bird, you're strapped in all of a sudden it starts sliding out and again, short trip. So um, safety with that. But if you got that thing cinched down, that friction adapter, it's not going anywhere. It's going to give you the security. We'll talk about more of the slings and how the slings will aid to the security of this belt system here. All right, so for simplicity's sake, this is what uh, we pretty much choose because it's kind of that multi-mission thing. I can, I have the security in the aircraft. I know it's secure. It works with everything I have in here. It's minimal uh, equipment and slings and, and uh, excessive webbing flying everywhere. And it works when I get on the ground in case I got to go do another mission. Now, moving into uh, sling systems, actually rigging the aircraft itself. Now, there's a lot of different stuff out there, um, but what I like to try to find is something that's kind of a dedicated retention lanyard like this system here. Uh, it's got a really heavy-duty shock cord inside of it, so it doesn't get that excessive webbing. So if I'm leaning over here, that excessive webbing on a standard piece of tape rope or sling rope isn't just flapping all over and possibly getting around that collective. So when I stretch out, it stretches out with my tension and when I come back it goes back in so again minimizing excessive waste of webbing and possible things going wrong in the aircraft so we want to really think about that snap shackles are really important guys it it's 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 very vital in regards to if something happens to the helo and you got to get out in an emergency you got to be able to disconnect yourself from this helo very, very fast. Um, not only that, but just like Travis had mentioned earlier, if all of a sudden you go into more of a support role or you're gonna be utilized somewhere else, you want the ability to get out of the helo really quickly, detach and, and go, so. Make sure you find, a, if you're gonna use a snap shackle or emergency release system like this one, make sure that it's got a very high tensile strength. Um, this, uh, these are rated sometimes over 1,000, 2,000 pounds. Um, so make sure you're getting a good one because there's a lot of copies out there, a lot of fakes that are real cheap, made in uh, places that you don't really wanna buy from. And these springs will come loose, they'll pop out. So make sure you're getting a really good quality snap shackle. Because again, it's a safety, it's a quick disconnect. Um, but we're using it as a primary source for connection in here, which you'll see here in a minute. <clears throat> carabiners. Anytime I'm working with carabiners or anytime, I like, anytime I'm using what I like to call anchor points, I'm always going to run a locking carabiner, especially with vibration of the aircraft, things moving around. You're, we're going to show you guys later weapons inflation moving across this, this side of this aircraft here. Um, sometimes things can bind it or loosen, so we want to use locking car carabiner just to add that added extra value of safety there. So let's say you're going to find yourself in the role of being on aerial platform a lot, then uh, I would go the extra end and, and look for a really good dedicated retention lane or something like this. Now, a lot of times, uh, you know, hasty operation, hey, we don't have that in a perfect world, so what can we use? Well, again, if you're a rope management expert or somebody that's uh, used to search and rescue type operations and rigging aircraft or rock climbing or stuff like that, 
there's all kinds of stuff out there on the market like Spectre slings. These things are are uh, are just incredible strength. The tensions, uh, tension, tensile strengths of these things are just incredible. Um, so you can use these just like if you're putting an anchor system on a rock climbing situation. Prusik cords, um, smaller millimeter ropes, really good, which we'll uh, show you guys here. I did provide a system in a minute. Or even your standard sling rope. Your uh, dynamic or current mantle ropes will work for this kind of situation as well. <clears throat> There's thousands of types of slings, ropes, and, and retention lanyards out there. Um, basically, you're going to have to improvise and find the best system that fits your aircraft that you're using. Um, there are, are many different types of aircrafts out there. Sometimes you've got some of the same aircraft with different configurations inside. This is an A-Star, for example, with a pretty slick interior. We're going to show you some, some uh, examples for that, which is an improvised example, but it's really solid. Um, now, if you're, uh, uh, say, a military unit, where you're going to have probably you know, framing systems in here for rappelling and fast roping, you can just utilize those. Um, deck plates on the inside. There's no deck plates on this A-Star here, but there are seatbelt rings, so we're going to go ahead and, and tie into the seatbelt rings. But if your aircraft doesn't have all that elaborate system, then you're going to have to improvise, and that's, that's no problem. And, and you can do that with these simple lanyards and Prusik ropes and stuff here. All right, guys, the next thing that we're going to do is we're gonna actually, I'm actually going to rig myself into the, into the helicopter. We actually chose this, this setup because it works best in this particular aircraft. Again, remember that part, part of your responsibility is improvising based on the helicopter and the mission that you guys are actually doing. Generally, I would like to keep this snap shackle right here hooked into this ring. One of the reasons why is in the event that the helicopter has an emergency I need, and I need to get out of the helicopter, I can quickly pull the disconnect and get out. What that also does is that means this hard point of the carabiner is hooked into the aircraft so if all of a sudden Travis needs to get in or there's a roll reversal, these things are already left inside the helicopter. They're not with me. So there's just a couple considerations that you need to think. I said that's what I generally would like to do. But on this particular aircraft, one of the dilemmas is I cannot get this carabiner into this hook portion of the aircraft. Okay, so I can't, it won't fit because these rings are too small. So what I'm going to have to do is actually reverse it. So again, you're constantly compromising uh, what you need to do to accomplish that mission. All right, guys, next thing I'm going to do is I'm going to run the snap shackle through this uh, D-ring right here. One of the things that you want to make sure is that this portion is accessible to you and that it's not going to bind into the seat or get caught into a seat belt or anything else. So if you do have to exit the aircraft, you can reach behind, grab this, pull it, and get out of the aircraft in a timely manner. So now I'm going to feed it through. Make sure once it snaps in, I put a little tension on it. Remember, it's your ass hanging from the helicopter, so I'm going to make sure that this thing is anchored in. So this one's done. This one right here, just going to take my time, rig it through the same manner. Put some tension on it, make sure it's good. Obviously, it's on this one, it's, it's outboard, so I can grab this one with my left hand, this one with my right hand. As far as the beaners go, again, make sure you get a good lock and beaner and then double lock this thing. <clears throat> now, while Chris is climbing out of the aircraft, some things that are, people are probably asking is like, why aren't you just sitting on the seat and using the seat belts? You want to be outside this aircraft as much as possible to get away from the vibration of the aircraft. And we're going to show you with the weapon sling system how we, we have buffered that as much as possible. And this particular rigging system on this aircraft and utilizing this skid is what you want to look for. That's what you want to do. When you get lazy and comfortable and sit inside on a seat belt, you are absorbing all the aircraft vibration and everything through that weapon system all the way to the muzzle. So you're going to have um, pretty much the aircraft fighting against you. So we want to get away from that. So we want to set ourselves up for success and that's what Chris is doing here. That's why we're folded the seats up. We've, any of the excess webbing from the seat belts are hanging down. We've either retainer banded it with a rubber band or we have secured them or taken them out in order to do this mission. This is a part of mission planning right here, setting the aircraft up for success, okay? I'm gonna to try to keep things as slick as possible. I'm gonna to try to get out on that skid like Travis talked about earlier. Um, a lot of people would normally, some people think it's better to rig to the D-ring and keep it behind you. But again, I wanna be able to work in front of me and be able to m manipulate whatever I need to do, whether it's to get out and then not only that, but this actually helps 
press me back into the helo so I can use it as leverage and actually push out on it when we start that shooting portion should it go to there. This is also how we justify using the riggers belt only instead of wearing a complete seat or a body harness. So now his riggers belt is obviously secure on his body but then when he clips in into the front of him you'll see where this one's going to go here in a second. Now you can see the, the added value safety of the retention devices going around him acting like almost another complete riggers belt and it's hooked into his riggers belt so now you have double the protection. Um, and now he can have a security feeling when he tensions these, these uh, retention lanyards out, he's not coming out of this bird. So this bird can do a complete bank and turn on a target or do a complete return to target which is a, almost a hammerhead dive which uh, we'll talk about here a little bit later and he can be completely comfortable outside the aircraft and he can hang on to the roller coaster ride without feeling like he's got to suck back in and go for his own safety. So this is, this, you want that tension all the time. You want to feel tension. You don't want to just feel loose because if that bird does an evasive maneuver, especially if you're in a combat zone as a military guy, you want to be able to stay out there and, and stay in the fight instead of um, submitting back inside the aircraft, which happens a lot of the time. Again, if you hook to the rear, a lot of times what you're feeling is it's, it's not as secure Plus, it's a, it's a lot of stress on your back. So those that may have prior back injuries or something like that, what you're doing is you've got one point that everything is joining, just pulling straight back on you. Here, again, it's wrapped around me. So if I lean out here and I start to work the gun here, I'm clear, as you notice, there's not a lot of fabric. There's not anything hanging. There's not a lot of excess uh, gear here, especially since this is flown from the left seat. So I want to be able to work the gun, lean out as much as possible. And then as we start to pass that target, again, I've got good tension here. It shifts and then I've got full range of motion right here that I can work with this particular system. Even if for some reason I get really down on this, you'll feel, uh, you'll see how the system works. It's one of those things that on, on camera you can't really appreciate it. You feel like when you look at it visually that you're not gonna feel secure, but as soon as you put this system on and you feel this thing pulling back, across your waist, you'll really feel secure in it, aside from the fact that you're going to be up in a, in a, in a helo and then leaning out the side of it. Think about also how, again, what I just talked about with not utilizing the seats or getting outside this aircraft, what else does that give Chris out here besides a 180 degree shooting platform? It gives him 180 degrees of surveillance platform. He can see everything. He can say, hey, target six o'clock to the pilot. Um, and the pilot can make a decision based on what feedback Chris just gave him. Um, sitting inside the aircraft in the seat, you're limited to about a 30 or 45 degree field of view. And you can, spe and especially if you're going to employ a weapon offensively inside that, would you rather have 45 or 180? Which one would you rather have? So that's why we get outside because it all works together. The aircraft mechanics, the dynamics of the aircraft, the vibration, getting outside not only minimizes the vibration, but it also sets you up for better weapons manipulation because now you can get into almost a, a, a stance. You can get your lean forward instead of sitting back on a seat inside the aircraft. You're outside, you're aggressive, you can see everything, you can shoot everything, you can communicate everything, and you're getting away from the vibration. So that's what we want to look for. So biggest problem I see in aerial platform classes is guys just want to get comfortable and want to sit in that seat and they want to use the wrong weapon system, which aids to the problem. So. Okay guys, so now we're done showing you guys the perfect world scenario. Uh, we're going to go into a hasty system. So really simple. All I'm going to do here, and what I have, is basically a, uh, a Prusik rope. This is a 10 foot Prusik, okay? All I did was double it over with the double fisherman's knot. All right. Now, with that Prusik line, I'm going to incorporate two locking carabiners into it. So that's all the equipment I have for rigging here. I've got my rigger's belt on. I've got two locking carabiners and a 10-foot Prusik line. All right, so first thing we're going to do with this particular aircraft again is we've got small deck rings here. So again, I'm going to have to improvise. I can't use a locking carabiner on these deck rings because of all the seat belts and the other hardware that's there. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to feed the end of this line through this D-ring. Now what I'm going to do now is I'm going to clove hitch the opposite end of it. So again, basically a simple around the object clove hitch is what I'm utilizing here. And then I'll go ahead and tighten it up. Push the seat back and you can see my clove hitch right there coming out around the D-ring. Now what you're going to do is you're going to pull this around and just pull it in front of you. Wrap it around just like the retention systems except it's a continuous system here. Now what I'm going to do is I'm going to take my locking carabiner on this end 
and I'm going to route it through one of the seatbelt deck rings up here. And then I'm going to ensure to lock that carabiner down. All right, so again, we've pretty much looked at the same system we just had except with one continuous line with a cheap piece of rope. Now I'm going to take that other locking carabiner and I'm going to put it through my D-ring and I'm simply just going to route the line through it. And that's it. So now I've got that same shooting platform that you just saw Chris have with the retention lanyards. Same thing except it's a pretty much cheap improvised system. 10 foot per stick, two locking carabiners, and that's it. If you need to get out of the system quickly, you can basically just come back here, unlock, and you're still secure at this point, so if you were to follow the aircraft, you'd be okay. When the bird comes in, come out of this one and just leave this system in the aircraft. And that's it for the uh, improvised version. All right, guys, the next thing that we're going to cover is actually securing a weapon system. Instead of just running it on a sling off of our body, we want to have a little bit, uh, a little bit more tension on that gun, on that weapon system, so we can drive it and we can run it harder than, than what we would normally be able to do. We want to try to stabilize that, that, that gun as much as possible. What we have here is we have on, on this particular helo, since we don't have hard points to hook into with a gun, with our system, what we're going to do is a, this is a suction cup system from a camera, all we've done is taken the, uh, the little uh, bipod attachment off so we can utilize this to attach up here in a non-permanent fashion. Again, we're improvising. Improvising. We're using stuff that's out there on the market that's cheap. They're good industrial um, suction cups that really adhere to things. We've done a lot of load testing on these and they work really well. Um, just took the camera attachment point off and went in the sling system. One of the other things that you want is you want a good shock cord. Just like we talked about earlier, you want to be able to put tension on it, but as soon as you get off of it, it goes right back and, and flexes. So you want to have a little bit of flexibility as well. Down at the end, what we did is we put a QD stud, and then we just sewn it in right here with dental floss. Believe it or not, dental, dental floss can be really strong, uh, and that's what we're actually using for this. If you needed to, you could get it take it to a rigger, sew it, yeah, in a more professional model. This is, that's going to last, been using dental floss as a field expedient uh, tool for a long time and this stuff's really strong. Um, so that's just a quick, that's like we wanted to show you an improvised version that we just built in like five minutes and uh, it's easy for you to do unless you guys want to take it to a rigger like Chris said and have it professionally sewn up. Um, that's another option that you can choose to do. All right guys, the next thing we're going to do is talk about where to actually mount this. Our goal with this is to take out a little bit of the vibration that's naturally going to occur as as the heel is shaking all the way down to the gun. That's why we use a bungee instead of going with more of a hard nylon or, or rope. Um, the other thing is we are pressing out with this, but we're not trying to cave in the helicopter and fold it in half. So we want to have a little bit of tension on it, but not to the degree to where you're just completely getting on top of this thing um, and then possibly doing any type of damage to the helo. So there's that happy medium of where you're going to place it. Also, we try to place it as close to the frame of the helicopter as possible so that as you are punching out with your weapon system, again, you're, you're maximizing the, the use of, of this thing and, and splitting the difference. Now, lies birds are soft skin. This is, some of them are just plastics or fiberglass or real uh, thin metal. And uh, you put a lot of tension in the wrong area on some of these airframes and they will, they will buckle and, and dent the aircraft, so. All right, so I'm gonna utilize the suction cup Place it up top, secure it. First thing I'm gonna do is grab on the middle, middle portion of it, give a little pull down on it right now. Make sure I'm good. Looks pretty good. I'll pull down here and be prepared for this to come off the roof. See how that just came off the roof? So did, did you have a good mount on it or not? So again, one of the things that you want to take into effect when mounting this because the last thing you want to do is just hurry up throw it in the helicopter attach your gun to it and then this thing comes out so it's of, of no use to you whatsoever um, with these systems one of the other things to look at is this adjustment right here that allows us to flex and bend a little bit more to the roof of whatever particular aircraft you're utilizing here so again that's why we give these test procedures that's why we pull down on them just to make sure things are either secured or not secured so now i'm going to rig it up again putting some light coat of oil or even spitting on it real quick, getting it wet too. Obviously suction cups work better when they're, when they're uh, wet. And make sure to lock down the, the tension knob when you're done adjusting it to the curvature of the aircraft. Give that same pull down, should be good. 
And now this is basically my device that's gonna go to the back end of the weapon system. Now what we're gonna do is we're gonna actually attach it to the gun. There are a lot of different stocks that are out there. Basically what you're looking for is something good, something durable, something that is really strong. This just happens to be our stock. We've got built in uh, QD cups. So it allows us to clip in right here. Also uh, at this point right here, make sure that this QD cup is locked into position and doesn't end up coming out. And now the next thing that I'm gonna do is I'm gonna take my sling hook into the weapon system right here. So I've got two points on it, and then of course if I need to, I can disconnect from the gun in the event that it got trapped in, in the helicopter and I had to separate myself from it. If I have to, I can quickly pop this QD in, and I'm out with my gun. Just remember, you are connected to the, to the helo with this system, so you're not gonna get out too, too far before you start realizing there's a problem. Now I'm gonna start utilizing my harness and putting everything together in use. If I come up on a target, I can actually get my gun up, start driving that gun, and moving and actually following that target however I need to, put in tension, utilizing the waist straps how I need to. And again, all this is doing is giving me a little bit of uh, tension to the rear, okay? And that allows me to keep driving the weapon system all the way out to right about here is where I would be extended. So as you guys can see with this system right here, it actually helps out. Uh, just like the rigging, you know, with the slings, we kind of keep it simple as well. Uh, I like to use just, we keep our sling in a single point configuration. Um, so I have flexibility of movement. There again, this, there's not a lot of straps and ex excess webbing going everywhere. And basically this is my primary retention device in case my aircraft system fails. Um, or in case I've got to relinquish control of my weapon system and work around. I still feel confident in my own sling system that I'm used to wearing on a daily basis. So some systems you'll see out there, like uh, we used to use ones that clipped onto each side of the rail system, uh, but then you had some really elaborate sling systems coming back in your face and your comm systems, and if you had to really swing hard, sometimes it would knock your stuff loose and distract you, so we don't want that. And uh, experimenting a lot more, I found that a single piece of shock tube going to the stock of the weapon, which obviously translates all the way down the weapon system all the way to the muzzle, uh, really takes out more vibration than having multiple attachment points. Now like with, what we talked about with the squad automatic weapon system earlier, that's a specific type of sling system because of the weapon's weight and the way it's got to be uh, worked on there. So, um, but for this, that is, that's the best system you can find. It's, it's cheap, it's simple to make, and uh, it's very, very effective. Okay guys, before we start rigging this Bell 205 or Huey platform, uh, I want to talk a little bit more about utilizing aircraft for surveillance, uh, real-time intel type uh, platforms. When you're flying over some location, obviously you want to be as, as uh, inconspicuous as possible. You, for, well, for example, look at this aircraft. This does not look like a police helicopter, does not look like a military helicopter. Okay, the last thing you want to do is fly a police helicopter over a drug house uh, or a target house that you're about to hit because they're gonna, it's going to give your location away. So sometimes outsourcing to other companies is really a good idea because of that, that uh, camouflage factor. It could be a tourist helicopter, maybe a firefighting helicopter. These guys, could, these guys are equipped to put water buckets on the bottom. You could sit inside this thing with a, a telephoto camera like this and with a water bucket, people are going to look outside and not think a thing of it, especially out west where there's a lot of fires. Um, so some things to think about right there. Talking about camera retention, obviously any type of sling system, um, you want to secure it just like you would anything else in the aircraft. And obviously keep in mind when you're flying over a target house, I mean obviously there's your own reconnaissance surveillance SOPs that you can incorporate into the aerial platform operations, but uh, obviously you don't want to be circling overhead. Get a good tar tar uh, telephoto lens or something that you could offset for a couple uh, kilometers away, take some photos inconspicuously and, and uh, make one pass and that's pretty much all you get. So make sure you're set up, uh, whether it's door open or you've got a real clear window, and you're going to get your shots the first time because that's the only shot you're going to get when you're doing surveillance. So just uh, some golden nugget camera tips there. All right, for the Bell 205, for this platform here, I'm going to start off um, with heavy weapons rigging first. Now the 205, the Huey platform, is pretty they're pretty consistent across the board. Uh, all the older models from Vietnam to nowadays pretty much have most of the same deck hardware, deck rings, and ceiling hardware. Um, so not a lot of not a lot of differences like you'll find in your 500s, your Jet Rangers, your A Stars, and all those other really common aircraft that can have different internals. So that's a good thing about this platform. The bad thing about this platform, it's loud. You can hear it coming from miles away. So if that's a, if that's a factor in your mission planning, then you need to think about proper aircraft selection there. But if you utilize this, it's a it's a common military aircraft. 
Uh, a lot of uh, outsourced agencies use them, some law enforcement agencies use them. So we'll go ahead and talk about how to rig this aircraft. All right, for heavy weapons, I'm going to go ahead and utilize the same deck hardware sling retention that Chris was using the A-Star earlier. Uh, since we've got really heavy deck rings here, really big deck rings, I can actually utilize the carabiners inside of them and put the quick releases on my riggers belt, unlike what Chris had to do over there. So for this, there's deck rings all over the bottom of this aircraft for this size retention sling. I found the one that works for me. So I'm going to go ahead and clip the carabiner in with the gate up. Always a good thing to remember there when you're clipping in carabiners. The way you can access, I'm going to lock, I'm going to lock the carabiner down. See them over here, I found this side. Um, for me, it's a second ring in. Make sure that our rings are, make sure that our locking carabiner is facing upward. Lock that one down. So basically we have the same system as what we had over on the A-Star. We're utilizing the rigger's belt. I'm gonna go ahead and clip in the snap shackle with the release lanyard out. I'm gonna come over here and do the same thing with this other one. Release lanyards out. So if I need to get out of the system, I can come out really quickly if I need to. But these things are bomber. And I've never seen them released prematurely. Okay guys, that's a heavy weapons rigging right there for the shooter rigging. I'm not outside the aircraft because I'm about to have a big weapon system. I got this Sasser right here uh, we're about to employ. I'll show you the proper hardware for this type of system or bolt guns. And uh, for that, again, I'm a little bit back inside the bird, okay, because this weapon is really heavy. So let's go ahead and roll right into the sling system. What I've got here is a 10-foot Prusik cord I've doubled over, again with a double fisherman's knot, okay, and I've got two, for this case, just non-locking carabiners. What I'm going to utilize here are these OSHs, okay, or O-shit handles. These handles go into the, the deck rigging or the ceiling rigging of the, uh, the Bell 205. So this one's already in in the location that I need it in, and for these, basically, you just pop them in, press it up, and then again, you want to double check, make sure they're solid. All I'm going to do is take our nine lockings and hook them into the metal D-ring portion of the OSH. Okay, so this is pretty much it. This is my system right here. Now, for like the 50 count, starting with it since it's the heaviest weapon system, and like we said earlier, maybe we've got it employed on an armored vehicle or something like that. Maybe it's military. Hey, maybe somebody stole an armored vehicle um, in a city somewhere, and you guys got to put it down. They're armed and dangerous. They're shooting everybody and uh, you guys have made the decision to take the vehicle out, I'd probably pick this weapon system to do it. So what I'm going to do from here is, all, is I'm going to take the Prusa cord and I'm going to run it between the bipod and the upper receiver of the weapon. Okay, so basically when I'm leaning this thing forward and press it outside the aircraft, it's resting against the bipod adapter. Okay, so now that is pretty much it. So what I have here is a good range of motion. It'll slide, and I'm not really holding the weapon's weight. The weapon's doing all the work, and the sling's doing all the work. So all I need to do is, for me, the kneeling position is the most comfortable for this. Okay, I can still see. I've got a pretty good view, about 160 degrees right here from inside the aircraft. Obviously, it's hard for us to get outside the aircraft like we did on the A-Star because we've got a 30-something pound weapon here. For uh, weapons manipulation, I like to put my hand on the carrying handle here if you've got one. If not, you can still get a good high center of bore grip and lock that elbow out so you can handle that recoil, okay? Because you may be shooting at a real extreme angle here. Now, if I need to adjust or shoot, I can slide this thing down, I can engage, I can switch knees if I have to, and I can drive out, push out, and engage almost to the rear of the aircraft. So I've got a pretty big range of motion with this big gun, and I can slide it quickly if I need to. Okay, so that's what we want to get here. And this is probably the most practical and the easiest system to use with the uh, 50 cal system like this. All right, let's show a, uh, a lighter weapon system. Let's put a bolt gun in here. So this is a smaller patrol 308. What I'm gonna do here, obviously we can check, we've got night vision on this one, it's set up for our night ops, um, but uh, it's for good weight purposes, we can go ahead and test the system now. And so we're gonna do the same thing. I'm just gonna put it between the receiver and the bipod. Okay, so now I can, get some dry practice with this as far as feeling the weight feels good there for daytime operations we're obviously going to go ahead and take it off okay utilizing a bolt gun in the same system the reason I like to do that is so I have forward pressure on the gun 
um, I can work the action of this gun with almost one hand. So that means I can keep another hand on the gun, keep my cheek on the gun, look through the optic. Hopefully I've got a, a variable power optic where I can tone down like we talked about earlier. And I can keep on target, I can cycle the bolt and never come off the target by just keeping those mechanics working for me. So unlike the, the single point system or the bungee system, I want to be able to have all the mechanics working for me. I want to be able to have as many things going here for me as possible. My hands on the gun, I can utilize this hand freely, I can stay on my target looking through the optic, and I can fire and rapid bolt manipulation, fire, rapid bolt manipulation, because that's, that's going to be a very limited time frame that you have with this particular weapon system to get rounds on target, unlike an auto gun. So again, that's why I like to choose this particular system for a bolt action weapon, because it's helping me help the weapon. All right, guys, let's move in to the same system that we had on the A-Star and the Huey, working light weapons and uh, squad automatic weapons. Okay, guys, so I've taken down my heavy weapons rigging here, and now I'm going to go ahead and move out on the skid more, so I need to move my retention lanyards forward one D-ring or deck ring. So again, I'm going to hook them in, lock them down, do a tension check, and now I'm outside the bird and I've got good tension either way, just like we had earlier on the A-Star. I can slide back and forth, I can see now almost 100 and almost 200 degrees plus, okay? So this is where I want to be. We're going to go ahead and rig the saw first before we get into light weapons. Now the saw, like we talked about earlier in the weapons system segment, is got its own sling system. Now all we're going to do here is this is going to be connected into one of those OSHs. So we're going to take that OSH down that's over here. I'm just going to move it straight above my head. Take my carabiner and I'm just going to hook it in right here into the red. So now as you guys can see this thing kind of works like it's on its own little gyro system. We developed this over in Iraq. Uh, we were running saws a lot as a suppression weapon and it's really Again, like I said earlier, it's, it's surprising how accurate this weapon can be full auto from an aerial platform when you use the fundamentals correctly. So again, I've got my sling system going for me. I've got that shock cord going. I've got a good balance here. If I need to relinquish control, I can relinquish control with it and do other things if I absolutely need to. But this is pretty simple. We've got that same mounting system as a light weapon, and now I can transition this weapon all the way around. And I have hardly any of the weight of the weapon in my hands. But all the vibration has gone out of it because I'm outside the aircraft. So I can sit there and get target 1 o'clock, 200 meters, and start engaging, 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 and just shift all the way. Now, if you're a taller guy, what you can do is I like to get a little more leverage. I like to put my foot down on the skid. So I'm actually utilizing the back of my calf against the top skid or the foot rest and my foot is down locked onto the skid and I've got my forward foot here. This gets me outside the aircraft a little bit more and gives me more weapons manipulation leverage. Gives me more of a recoil abutment to recoil against for this bolt to come back against. So now when I'm engaging, 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 here I get to a stress point. But that's okay, all I need to do is shift my ass off the seat, step down and step up. So it puts me outside the aircraft more and actually gives me a way better shooting platform. All right, so that's the advantage of that of both of those positions. Again, if you're the shorter guy, I like to put my foot here against this little this skid bar or this footstep bar because that gives me again leverage, and we want to have leverage. We want to have all our body mechanics working just like if we're on the flat range or shooting in a shoot scenario on the ground. I want to be able to utilize that up here in the air as well. The other great thing about this sling system, not only does it take all the vibration out and give me a hands-free gyro feel of the gun, it also helps me if I have to do weapons manipulation. Okay, if I engage and I get a misfire, I can easily grab the gun and it stays here. It's controlled, the weight is controlled by the airframe and I can manipulate this gun if I need to. Instead, if I didn't have a sling system, it would be sitting on my lap freehand, which a lot of guys like to do, but now you're doing a lot more. You've got, to, you've got more work to do here. You've got to control the weapon harder here, and then you've got to get the weapon back up. Okay? Now you can keep it in your shoulder and do it as well, but it's just better. It's value added to have the aircraft helping you throughout shooting and weapons manipulation, so why not use that? And that's why we picked this simple system here. When uh, manipulating the saw, if you do need to reload it, you can see, like we talked about earlier, where these are connected to the front sight. That's why you have two points here. So it takes off a lot of the weight of the weapon and now I'm free to work 
change my box, my belt, whatever I need to do, get back in, slap it down, charge it, and continue to fight, okay? So that's a saw weapon system there. And you can also do it with other various squad automatic machine gun uh, systems. Okay guys, let's move more into light weapon systems. Okay guys, so what we're doing now is we're moving into uh, our lightweight practical weapon system, our carbine, uh, my weapon of choice for most 95% of most aerial operations like we've talked about. I'm going to utilize the same anchor point as I did on the squad automatic weapon system and I'm going to utilize the same tension sling that Chris used in the A-Star earlier. I've got a carabiner on the end of it. We're going to go ahead and lock it in to the D-ring portion of the OSH, okay? Now, I've adjusted this to fit for me and my weapon system, so a good thing to always carry with you are retainer bands, okay? Or rubber bands, because the last thing you want is this whipping you in the face at, at 100 knots. So just get it up as high as you can. I like to use a heavy weight retainer band, double it over, and that's good. That'll stay out of your way. So again, same rigging, shooter rigging system as we had on the, on the squad automatic weapon. So I'm moved out, I'm on the skid again. Now I'm just gonna take my carbine, take my QD, stick it in the QD cup on the stock. Now I'm ready to go. Let's talk about some weapons manipulation. Some key factors that you need to take into consideration when you're engaging a target at a moving speed. Uh, we like to call it lag, okay, because we're not leading a target anymore, because we're no longer a stationary shooting platform. We are now a moving platform that shoots. Now the target is basically stationary, comparable to our aircraft uh, speed, okay? So what we have to do, instead of leading that target like we typically would do in a ground situation, we now have to lag the target, which what happens is our forward speed and that bullet flying flies forward with your forward momentum of the aircraft and meets the target. On that one. Okay, so that's why we lag the target. We hold the leading or the tail edge of it, depending obviously on your aircraft speed and your distance. Okay, a typical safe shot, 150 to 200 feet to out to 200 yards. Anything beyond that, I kind of get in that liability zone. Unless I'm doing a suppression like destruction raid, I know I'm going to kill somebody. Um, then I'll attempt to fire that shot, especially with a saw or something like that. And I know it's in a um, in a faraway land where we can we can do that, and that's what the mission calls for. But for more of a precision shot, making your hits, and what's going to count tomorrow is how you hold on that target, okay? Depending on the elevation, the distance, the angle of the target, angle can sometimes come into effect if you're pushing past a couple hundred yards. Um, so typical rule of thumb is if you're out there and you got to shoot somebody from a high, high angle, aim low, pretty much the waistline, and you'll hit them in the chest, okay? All right, guys, once I've got all this, this rigging going for me, I've gotten outside the aircraft, I'm in that good leverage position, and I am minimizing all the vibration throughout the weapon. It is just like you're on the range. When you, if you could forget about this behind you and forget about your speed and the rotor above your head, it is just like on the range. It is me, this optic, the target, trigger control, side alignment, following through. All of it stays the same as what you're doing out of the fly range. So if you feel uncomfortable, if you feel like you're not getting your hits, you're probably not utilizing the fundamentals properly. So again, shooting is shooting is shooting. We're just on a platform that's moving now, so we're just taking in consideration some of the lagging that we talked about and, uh, and all the other factors that are going in. And the reason I like to use this carbine, this weapon system right here, like we talked about in the optics portion, is because I could focus. I could shoot just like I normally would on the range dynamically. I can move quickly. I'm not taking a precision shot. It is very hard to gauge from a moving aircraft at a certain altitude and a certain speed what your lag really needs to be. I can't tell you as an instructor to a student that you need to lag at 150 feet at 40 knots, four inches behind the plate. Because to, for, for anybody to really be able to gauge that unless they do this on a daily basis uh, is very difficult to do. And there may be some times where you have to take a shot, watch for splash, and adjust off of that, okay, if you're not proficient at shooting out of this aircraft. Now, I'll tell you, the more you shoot out of an aircraft, obviously, just like shooting on the flat range, you're going to be able to pick things up. You see a moving target go by, you know where to lead on that thing at any given distance on that flat range. So, just like on the flat range in this aircraft, that will come into play as well with proficiency. So, that's a difficult thing to do. Um, you can utilize vehicles you know, as a dry practice type of thing. You can get in the back of a pickup truck, try to get on a flat road and drive and try to shoot down a hill. If you have that type of range capability, that's pretty far extreme, but we've done that before for training and that is a good way to stay proficient without putting a bird in the air. 
So uh, little things like that uh, really help your weapons manipulation and your, and your proficiency and your accuracy on the target. All right, so something else we want to take in consideration is weapons manipulation. What if you need to do a speed reload uh, while you're in the air? Maybe you've got multiple targets. Uh, maybe you're suppressing somebody really hard and you've got to do a speed reload. Well, again, setting yourself up for success like we talked about, and I'll show you guys how it works right here. All right, weapons manipulation stays the same. I always want to keep my firing hand on fire control so I can manipulate the weapon system. We've got our bad lever on here so I can do that. I can control locking and releasing, and that really helps here in this situation when I'm in the air, I'm flying at 100 knots, uh, shooting at 100 yards. I've got a lot of things going on. The last thing I want to be doing is breaking the weapon down, which is hard to do now because, again, we have a tension device on the stock and trying to lock this thing to the rear back here. It gets difficult. So, again, I like to be able to work the gun right here if I need to. Coming behind you. Yep. All right, now we'll be good. Now, if I run into a reload situation, what I have to have is this laner system on that mag because I don't care about that mag. I'm getting rid of it. So, if I go into a lo bolt lock situation, I'm going to immediately release the magazine, insert the other one, hit the battery assist device, send the bolt back to the rear, I'm ready to fire again. So I just speed reloaded in about under a second there. This thing, it just hangs. When I get done with that threat, now it can be a situation where I can stow it. I've got a little fast X device on here. I can pop it off if I need to and put it away and then put another magazine on if I need to. So it just comes off, goes right back on. You can get, this is a simple flashlight lanyard or a keychain lanyard. You guys can find them anywhere. You could just use 550 core with little uh, keychain carabiners. They work great. So uh, good, good little gold nugget right there. Safety note on this magazine. If you do not retain your magazine and you do a speed reload and you are shooting out of specifically the right side of the aircraft especially, and this little thing goes into the tail rotor, what do you guys think is going to happen? You're going to have a short ride to the ground. Okay, this will destroy an aircraft. So this is a, this little lander right here, this little lander to me cost, how much does this thing cost, Scott? How much does this aircraft cost? Uh, three and a half, four million dollars. Okay, so this lander cost me about four million dollars if, if I don't have this thing set on the gun. So just think about that, okay? And more importantly, the lives that are inside the bird, obviously. So again, make sure everything is retained. Again, reminder, brass even. A piece of brass going into a tail rotor spinning at 5,000, 6,000 RPMs, is that what it runs? 7,000 7, RPMs. We'll take down an aircraft, okay? I've landed many aircraft in Iraq because we had a piece of brass going into the tail rotor and you might as well just walk up to it and shoot it. That's how bad a damage it does to it. So, uh, and unfortunately in that situation, you're done. Your aerial platform operation is over and you've got to set down immediately and, and uh, assess that aircraft, make sure it's still flyable to get you home. And if you're over in Durka Durka stand somewhere, that's the last thing you want to do is set down in somebody's backyard and uh, get out and check your tail rotor and shut down for a little while. So think about that. Plus, if it hits in the wrong spot, you're not even going to have an opportunity to set down and check it to see if it uh, is ready to fly again. So very, very important safety notes there. Retain everything. That's why we go minimal gear. We go KISS gear. Keep it simple, stupid method. KISS on the weapon system. Everything is retained, dummy corded. Safety, safety, safety. Okay, guys, I've got uh, Scott with me from HeliQuest. Uh, he's one of their pilots here that's going to be flying with us today and tomorrow. Um, we have talked about all the other aspects of aerial platform operations as far as aircraft rigging, weapons rigging and selection. We talked about mission planning a little bit. We talked about SOPs and all the other things that go involved. But you can have all those things working for you in a great perfect world environment, but if you don't have communication, if you don't have the, the relationship with the pilot shooter uh, and that dialect that's very specific there, then you might as well just scratch the whole mission. So that's one of the most important parts. Just like in any job, communication is, is survivability. And the better communication you have, the better your survivability rate's gonna be. So what we're gonna start off with is uh, we're gonna talk about setting yourself up for se success with the rigging again. We're gonna go into a little bit more rigging here before we talk about um, the dialect back and forth. So the two types of comms, uh, your switches here are gonna be either a voice activated system, which means the mic is hot all the time. 
Um, so you can you can talk into it at any time, and everybody in the bird's going to hear what you're saying. Uh, then you have a push to talk, which some birds only have a push to talk. So you actually have to push a button every time. So with the voice activated, that's great, um, especially on a system that you can you can dial down and get rid of all the the uh, other sounds and um, get rid of the wind. Uh, having the little foamies on the end of the mic is is really important when you're hanging outside that aircraft, like we talked about in the the uh, weapons manipulation part. So uh, make sure you're set up for success there. So when you're running your headset, think about where it's connected. There's some uh, aircraft like this one, for instance, the Saystar has two uh, J boxes. It's got one up here behind the pilot seat and the one back up here. I like to keep them a little bit lower so it keeps the cables out of my way so that in case they fly in front of my face or something. Um, plus, I can activate the push to talk a little bit easier. So now we know the voice activation is, is pretty simple. You're just going to talk in the system. But for that bird that doesn't have that voice activation, you may have to hold this in your reaction hand as you're flying because it's obviously hard to push to talk, communicate, and identify a target, track the target, and try to get a good sight acquisition on it and then attempt to fire. So a lot of birds, if you got enough slack here, you can hold it in your hand. I know on some weapon systems you can even mount them. Um, I've seen them mounted on the side of the rail systems before. And you can basically sit here and talk press the button, communicate with the air crew commander, and work your targets as necessary. So something to think about there, pretty important, because a lot of times if you put it here on your vest or on your belt or something, you got to relinquish control of your weapon with your reaction hand, press the button to talk, and then that target might be getting away from you. And then you got to reacquire the grip, and you may want to say something else. You may need to give a correction to the pilot while you're trying to Re or reacquire that grip on the fire control or on the forehead of the weapon and you're going to miss your opportunity. So that's why it's important to make sure that your comms is set up for success. Alright, now let's talk about that dialect. Um, a lot of times shooters will get in the aircraft and they're they're kind of timid or they're they're not talkable guys so unfortunately you got to be a, a talker inside the aircraft because again that clear communication and having that good uh, dialect with the pilot is is, is paramount. So when you're talking to the pilot, make sure you have clear, precise, very quick communication, like short talk. So for an example, if I was to see something on the ground, uh, he may have a lot of things going on up here. He may be talking to ATC, air traffic control. He may be talking to another, uh, um, another cruiser on the ground or military guys on the ground. So if I'm gonna come in and break in on him, I'm gonna tell him, target nine o'clock, 300 meters. And then he's gonna identify and probably at that point is where the gelling is going to have to happen. You're going to have to know prior to that mission, what is he going to do? What's the expectation of, of him in that aircraft? Is he going to bank that aircraft hard to that 9 o'clock? Well, if he does that, and I'm attempting to fire at the same time because we didn't work out that communication prior to the mission planning, guess what I just did? I just shot through the rotors, which is very easy to do. These rotors will dip on you all day long in even slight turns. Now, if I say target 9 o'clock, 200 meters, he knows inside his mind, because we're proficient from working together, that he doesn't really need to bank the target that much. He can kind of trim it to the left a little bit and because he knows that I'm capable of taking that shot at 200 yards. So there's that range thing you need to work out as well. Remember, anything outside that 200-yard line area is you're probably getting a little bit shakier liability-wise, especially as an LEO uh, or um, a law enforcement officer. Military guys, you may have to suppress a target at a distance. That's fine. But you guys that earn jobs that may increase that liability because you take a shot at 400 yards from a moving aircraft, that's hard to do, okay? And when you do that and you miss, where did that round go? So instead of me sitting here and telling him to hold at 400 yards, I can say left bank. He left banks and with a, within a second, we're now within 200 or 100 yards. So that aircraft can be on top of that target that quickly. So which one would you rather do? Be on top of the target in a second and engage him accurately and have less liability or take a chance at 400 yards and waste 30 rounds and have 30 rounds going off into the streets of whatever city you're operating in. Uh, or it may be a faraway country, maybe you're overseas in a combat area. You know, that's still a liability. You hit an innocent person, that is a liability. And you need to take that into, into effect there. So, for example, um, maybe I see a target at six o'clock. We have some commands, uh, you know, as far as, you know, we know we're calling out of range, we know we're calling out of clock direction, but something we use is RTT. So if I said, Scott, target, six o'clock, RTT, 500 meters. So he knows, okay, RTT, return to target. Yeah, return to target, so, so I know the target's behind me. Obviously, I'm facing forward at the 12 o'clock position. Target's behind me, we need to acquire it. So I'm gonna basically be doing what an RTT is in the uh, civilian world, it's known as an ag turn. You're basically pulling the nose up a little bit and kicking in some turn, or kicking in some tail, 
and turning the helicopter back to the six o'clock position. Now this is a pretty evasive and can be an aggressive maneuver and at that point because he and I are gelling together, I'm gonna say, okay, copy, RTT, coming left. I'm basically gonna be turning the helicopter pretty hard to the left, kicking in some tail and returning to the six o'clock position. He knows that he cannot engage that target until I roll out of that turn and the rotor disc is back in a level position. So, and then I can say, okay, green light or something, you know, some sort of command. Again, short talk where he knows that it's safe to engage. Hey, go hot. So, Scott, what are some uh, what are some other considerations that you might want to take in, whether inside the aircraft communications or dialect? Well, I think it's important to point out that um, you know, with different helicopter operators nationwide, that different law enforcement agencies may be utilizing, each helicopter operator will be using different types of helicopters. Even though we have two B2 A stars here in the hangar right now, they're both configured differently as far as the communication systems go. So I think it's important that once you do find that, that right helicopter operator to work with, it's important to get the agency in there and spend half a day um, going over everything that uh, Travis and Chris have been going over with as far as the rigging goes, where to find all the hard points for all your rigging systems, and then making sure that the communication systems work with your helmets and all that good stuff and uh, you know just make sure that all that stuff is set to go before you actually go out on the mission because you could be utilizing a Bell 407, Bell Long Ranger, Hughes 500, A-Star B2, B3, and even just those few types of helicopters that I mentioned can be configured differently so instead of just showing up blind at some random helicopter operator say hey we want to use your helicopter I mean it's probably important to get in there and, and uh, you know make sure everything works so when you do actually get dispatched to go out and do a mission everything's already set all you do is you hop in you clip in you plug in your communications of course you already did your 10 or 15 minute brief with the pilot and the uh, law enforcement agency and off you go and do the mission you know I, Scott in our in our world we kind of compare that to um, dry firing okay do you need to go to the range do you need to do live fire to practice weapons manipulation now, so it's expensive, yes, to get this aircraft up in the air to take shooters out, which you obviously should do at least quarterly, what I would suggest, um, if you can get an opportunity, if you have that time and training opportunity to do so, I suggest to get the bird up in the air and to work all that out. But if you don't have that time and opportunity, but you can get over to a hangar to a facility like this, or your agency maybe has helicopters or your military unit, there's no reason why you guys can't go to that facility for two hours and work through with the pilots communication, dialect, rigging, weapons, sitting on the skid, getting comfortable, making sure all your stuff's pre-staged in case you do get a hot call one day and you have to come run in here and chase an active shooter or chase a, uh, you know, some insurgency around the world somewhere. Whatever the case may be, maybe it's a search and rescue operation or surveillance. You're jumping in here and you are clipping in with your pre-staged stuff and you're ready to fly. So. so I think another thing to point on too is uh, this helicopter in particular is uh, what they call carded with the Department of Interior, Forestry, BLM. So we do a lot of government work, so it has a lot of, it's equipped well for their types of missions. So we have a, uh, an FM radio in here that can be programmed with a lot of local law enforcement frequencies. So that's something else that, you know, he and I can go over. Also with this helicopter in particular, it's something you and I would go over before we actually got dispatched. Um, where Travis is sitting, he cannot communicate with the ground. So that's something that I would have to do for him. So. That's something that we would need to figure out again before we go out. So, I mean, there's so many different you know, variables. So that's why I just wanted to point out that it's important to go over all that stuff beforehand. And you probably know also, Scott, I've done a little flying um, since I was a kid with my dad, that communication, especially uh, with like working with ATC and people all around you or other aircraft can be difficult and, and needs practice as well. Um, and the same with the shooter back here, calling out those commands under stress. I mean, it's hard enough for me to just say, you know, Scott, target nine o'clock, 300 meters, RTT left side. I've got to really think about what I'm saying there. So to do that under stress with a guy with a gun or is about to shoot an innocent civilian or he's about to shoot at one of your police officers on the ground and you see it before they do, you're going to be amped up. So you've got to be able to practice that communication just like you got to come in here and practice, you know, uh, rigging, going out to the range, practice your weapons. So communication is, is paramount. You guys as law enforcement obviously understand that, but everybody out there needs to understand how important this one key aspect is right here and how that will make this mission so much more successful. Thanks, Scott. Appreciate it. Okay, guys, we're out here at the range, uh, the aerial platform operations range we're going to be shooting today. And uh, we've got a various array of targets set up out there, realistic targets, steel plates, and some LaRue poppers. 
First, what we're going to do is we're going to kick off a standard weapon safety brief, just like we're on the flat range, because we are going to be going hot here in a little bit. So, uh, first firearm safety rule: treat every weapon as if it were loaded. Okay, even if you've unsure that it is unloaded, you never point your weapon at anything you're not intended to destroy. Specifically, the helicopter. Okay, um, if you are loading the weapon system. Do not load the weapon system upward. I know we teach a breakdown and loading it, but we want you guys to make sure you have muscle awareness on the ground and in the air. Okay, what's above your head? The rotor. And uh, no loading inside the aircraft. You have to be out in your position. And when Chris or myself give you the command to go ahead and load, uh, the magazine will be inserted. You can just send your bolt home at that point. Okay, and then you're ready to go. Third firearm safety rule. Obviously, keep your finger straight and off the trigger and outside the trigger guard until you're up on target with the intent to fire. Fourth fire safety rule, keep your weapon on safe until we're up on target with the intent to fire. So just like if you're on a flat range, when you're coming in on your gun run and you're looking at your sights, you're looking at the target, come off safe and engage. As soon as you're done with your run, come back on safe. Fifth fire safety rule is very important out here, just like it is on the ground, but up here we've got a lot of different things to think about. Be aware of your target's foreground and its background before you fire. Again, like we talked about already, what are some of the things that could be in the foreground? Rotors, okay? Um, so that is the first thing that I identify before I even start to engage. Even if you think you're flying flat and level, it's always value added to look up at it, okay? On the ground, target's foreground, maybe there's people on the ground. Uh, maybe we've got st staging areas out here. Maybe the uh, vehicles are, you know, kind of at your one o'clock or something if you're flying that direction and they are not clear. If you you got to think about your reflection here. You got you got to think about your uh, ricochets. If you get around and you're firing at an angle and can skip over towards a safety area, you've got to be careful with that. Okay. So again, Chris is going to tell you when you're allowed to fire. Like Travis said, there's not a lot of room in this healer. This one's really small. So as you start to suck back in, make sure your muzzle's outside because uh, on this side, uh, with the pilot flying left seat, he's he's right there. So I want to really keep my muzzle away from him or any of the electronic packages in here. All right, let's turn and burn. Hold that leading to that trail edge and watch for impact. Okay. okay. Go ahead and get out on that skid, Joe. Don't be afraid of it. If I come up on a target, I can actually get my gun up, start driving that gun, and moving and actually following that target. Put that down right where you need it. Hold that down for them. So what we have to do, instead of leading that target like we typically would do in a ground situation, we now have to lag the target, which what happens is our forward speed and that bullet flying flies forward with your forward momentum of the aircraft and meets the target. Yeah, lag, gotta lag that target. Hop in guys, I'll set you up. Take my QD, stick it in the QD cup on the stock. Now I'm ready to go. Step the all right, Todd? Yeah, I'm good. Okay. All right, weapons manipulation stays the same. I always want to keep my firing hand on fire control so I can manipulate the weapon system. You, if you can forget about this behind you and forget about your speed and the rotor above your head, it is just like on the range. It is me, this optic, the target, trigger control, side alignment, following through. All of it stays the same as what you're doing out of fly range. So if you feel uncomfortable, if you feel like you're not getting your hits, you're probably not utilizing the fundamentals properly. So again, shooting is shooting is shooting.
when you first pulled that trigger, that first shot that you pulled out of the trigger, were you surprised how much to the right that shot was? I was, yeah, because these guys were saying all oh, about a foot or so. Yeah, and on some of them it could be five to ten, but faster you go to that 20 to 30 knots, that lags even more. Once, once you get to that edge of that threat, then you can keep it there. It's that first round's really tough. Excellent job. Thanks. Really good shot. Yeah, that's great. Good times. Good times, all right, man. Let's bail out. Yeah, all right. All right, guys, that concludes uh, aerial platform operations. Obviously, this is the meat and potatoes part along with the rigging. And now you're seeing where everything starts to come together. So having that confidence in, in the way in which you guys rig, there's different aircrafts. We don't have military helicopters here. We don't have 60s. We don't have uh, dolphin style helicopters like the, the Coast Guard uses. Those things gonna be modified differently. Uh, it's extremely important for you to understand what assets are in your area and what also assets are out there available for your department to purchase because they can uh, lend you to be more successful in that mission that you might be doing, whether it's shooting or whether it's reconnaissance or whether it's also uh, fast roping out of the heel onto a building to get more assaulters there in a timely manner. Uh, that all has to be taken into consideration. Uh, for a lot of you guys, that, that first trigger pull, you know, you see how 15 knots, only 15 knots, how far that bullet really goes off target. So as you can see, uh, semi-autos, there's a, there's a huge force multiplier with that weapon system. We have that tendency to where we initially want to put our dot dead center on what it is that we're shooting at. And then we get in a helo and we put that dot there and we squeeze off that first shot and it's five feet to the, to the right of where we intended to shoot or to the left depending upon which side of the helo and which way you were moving. Point being is our brains see that shot and on that semi-auto we automatically start driving and creating that lag that we need to and then once you fire off those next shots, those next consecutive rounds, that's when we start finding ourselves being a little bit more successful. For you, Garth, you know, on, on, on some of those, you were peppering right around that last popper, and then it was that last shot that put that thing down, which was which was outstanding. But that first shot wasn't there where it needed to be, but you walked it right into where you needed to be to finally, finally, on your last shot, put that popper down. So I thought you did a great job. I thought everybody did a great job. Yeah, guys, you know, hopefully now you can see how easy this really is, considering there's a lot of moving parts, um, but once you get out here and you do it, uh, it's the best way to, to experience it is to be in that helicopter and actually shoot from it. And you can see you guys from your second passes that you're getting hits. Um, and uh, once you got that lag down, like Chris was talking about, it was there. But going back to what I said in the beginning of the class, think about the asset available. Think about the resources and how, how much survivability um, bonus this gives you. Okay? It gives your ground teams. But you put putting yourself in a helicopter over those those ground forces, or as a surveillance, or or search and rescue uh, out in these canyons and stuff, it is it is just paramount in how much that gives your agency or your unit. So don't neglect it. Think about what we said in the beginning about you know, hey, the biggest thing I hear when I ask, well, hey, why don't you guys shoot from helicopters or use aerial platforms for other operations? They say, well, because of our budget. So think about what I said in the beginning of class and and uh, and do the math. It's not that bad. Um, Good shooting today, guys. Good flying. Everybody was safe. And uh, it was a pleasure, you know, being out here and working with you guys and working with HeliQuest and, uh, and everybody else involved. Victor, thanks for coming out and uh, sharing your knowledge with the night vision. And uh, stay proficient, guys. That's all you can do from this point on. You know the basic building blocks, and that's exactly what this is. All you can do is take it to the next level. Excel up that ladder of excellence. So uh, thanks for coming out. <laughs>